Welcome you all to the 45th World Skills Conference and uh, for the festivity of skills, I would say so. If we see what's happening, it's really a representation of the TVET system, of the skills production, of the skills usage. And for me, every World Skills Conference, every World Skills festivity is like a mirror what's happening today. And my name is Oleg Podolsky, and I'm the director of the federal product for the manpower for digital economy in Russian Federation. And what, uh, why do I like such conferences? It's the only time and place to meet my colleagues and friends and to discuss some important questions. But I'm not the only moderator today. Uh, Pavel Luksha is the initiator of the Global Education Initiatives. It's really luck to meet him here because he's traveling three, 365 days a year. Uh, Paul, uh, you know the situation all around the globe. Uh, probably you say, do we discuss the same issues or not? И те же вопросы. Как вы думаете, мы все время одно и то же обсуждаем? Здравствуйте. Меня зовут Павел Лукша, и я эксперт и Центр развития образования Сколково, основатель инициативы Global Education Futures. И мы смотрим на то, что происходит в нашем обществе, и пытаемся адаптироваться к этому. Почему появилась наша инициатива? Потому что изменения, которые происходят, они поистине глобальны. И я хотела сказать что первые, первые, первая конференция произошла здесь, четыре года назад, и тогда мы говорили о компетенциях будущего, и у нас были делегаты из 40 стран World Skills и многие другие эксперты, которые говорили о трансформации системы технического образования и профессиональной подготовки. И мы многое тогда обсудили четыре года назад, и сегодня мы видим, что уже было опубликовано перед этой конференцией несколько важных исследований. Сегодня мы говорим о компетенциях будущего. И действительно, это очень важная тема, потому что мы живем в век необыкновенной трансформации. Это искусственный интеллект, это также разрушение во многих индустриях. Мы видим различные технологии, биотехнологии, другие технологии, которые приходят в нашу жизнь. Сегодня мы будем обсуждать в том числе и эту тему. Как подрывается рынок труда, как нам необходимо к этому адаптироваться, и как мы адаптируемся с точки зрения подготовки кадров, и что, какое значение это имеет для нынешней образовательной системы, для колледжей, для школ, для университетов. И у нас сегодня есть наши спикеры, коллеги, и сейчас мы по очереди их представим. И я хочу вам представить... очень известного исследователя с точки зрения того, что происходит в этом мире. Это Карл Фрей из Оксфорда. Карл, ваша работа посвящена анализу того, как технологии влияют на будущее рабочих профессий и рабочих мест. И вы известны как один из тех людей, который открыто сказал по всему миру во многих дискуссиях, что в следующие 10-15 лет 50% процентов старых, старых профессий станут технически ненужными, потому что технология заменит эти профессии. Как адаптироваться к этому прогнозу сейчас? И вы сделали такой прогноз, и как вы считаете, он оправдывается или нет, и какие основные аспекты, которые подрывают наш рынок труда? Спасибо большое. Я хочу начать с того, что я на самом деле не детерминист в области технологий. Я думаю, что будущее нас ждет в любом случае то, которое нас ждет. И адаптация к этим новым технологиям зависит от многих выборов, которые мы должны ожидать. И действительно разделение труда между людьми и роботами и технологиями означает, что многие профессии, которые у нас есть сейчас, 
да, будут действительно не нужны в ближайшем будущем. Но если мы посмотрим, например, на такую профессию, как переводчик, мы можем, да, конечно, вести технологические, технологические разные инструменты здесь. Мы видим, что можно избавиться от переводчика также. Но в некоторых случаях необходимо, чтобы документ был сертифицирован переводчиком. И для того, чтобы это сделать, мы не сможем применить здесь никакую технологию. И то же самое можно сказать и о многих других сферах и профессиях. И когда меня попросили выступить здесь и говорить о будущем профессий, я подумал, а что же я могу сказать об этом? Как я могу знать, что нас ожидает в будущем? Какие будут в будущем профессии? Это то же самое, что в 1990-е годы спрашивать фермера, что, на каких работах будут вообще-то работать внуки или правнуки этих людей. И они наверняка бы не сказали, что они будут какими-то технологическими инженерами или агентами по бронированию путешествий и так далее. Многие профессии, которые существуют сегодня, мы и люди раньше о них ничего не знали и не представляли, что они возможны. Но я думаю, что у нас есть некоторое представление о том, что ожидает нас в будущем. Я думаю, по крайней мере, с точки зрения развития технологий и также вот этой пропорции между человеческим трудом и роботами. И мы также провели исследование, и мы также посмотрели на то, что 47% рабочих мест, скорее всего, будут заменены технологиями. Мы хотели посмотреть, что влияет на это и какие профессии, в общем-то, будут безопасны от замены технологиями. И здесь нужно, конечно, говорить о сложных социальном, сложном социальном взаимодействии. У нас есть чат-боты, конечно, как вы знаете, мы также пытаемся сделать из них людей, но, однако, некоторые скажут, что несколько лет назад чат-бот практически смог убедить других, что это не чат-бот, а настоящий человек. И если мы посмотрим на другие социальные роли, которые мы выполняем в ходе нашей работы, мы также видим, что некоторые профессии просто невозможно сделать цифровыми, заменить их технологиями. Здесь, конечно, мы говорим о искусстве, это классическая музыка и так далее. Но если у вас есть база данных со симфониями, например, и вы можете также отметить самые лучшие симфонии определенным знаком, и потом вы сможете комбинировать эти симфонии. Скорее всего, вы не напишете тот же шедевр, который написал, например, Стравинский и другие известные композиторы. И то же самое можно сказать и о других профессиях. Если мы посмотрим на трейдинг, на финансы, не значит, что если вы проанализируете все финансовые стратегии, которые используются раньше, то вы автоматическим путем придете к очень хорошим и эффективным инструментам и результатам. Просто я... Thank you, Carl. Well, uh, to continue what I just have said, uh, I know one number, it's about uh, 65% about the school children that are starting the schools today would have the jobs that are not yet here and we have to develop them and uh, if we say have a look at the businesses and uh, mostly 75 percent of the business leaders especially in the IT sector uh, when they are asked what where they would follow their companies to and they say we don't know so what is the next step for them in this respect I would like to ask our uh, senior skills and deployability specialist uh, Paul Kamen from ILO uh, Paul Uh, in this respect, uh, what is your idea about the demand for fundamental skills? Can we describe it somehow for the future, or it's completely impossible? Uh, thanks, um, and uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, um, uh, to be part of the panel. I guess the question you're asking raises some questions around, you know, skills anticipation and how do we understand uh, the changing skill demands in labour markets if that change is going to become more rapid and if those transformations are, are, are going to take place. And so 
Um, I guess this is a fundamental question that's, you know, been facing skill systems uh, since, uh, um, you know, the idea of uh, trying to deliver uh, to meet the, me the needs of the labour market has taken over sort of policy in terms of vocational education and training. So the whole sort of human capital agenda has raised this issue of, so how do we forecast skill needs? And, I, you know, there are different schools of thought around this and some people say, well, forget about centralised planning and even trying to forecast and really focus on individual institutions, understanding their labour market, building relationships with individual employers, working in skill ecosystems, understanding the dynamics of local areas and acting as service pro providers to respond to that. But clearly there are trends at a, at a regional level, at a national level and increasingly interregionally, which I guess put the issue of skills anticipation on the agenda and there are different mechanisms and examples and sets of institutional arrangements uh, in place that uh, uh, that, that provide examples of how you can go about that. And at the heart of that is really, you know, social dialogue and bringing the actors in the labour market together in a meaningful way so that they can have discussions around what are the skills that are required and how's the best way to respond to them. But I think the broader question about what does that mean for the structures of qualifications, structures of curriculum, um, if you assume that the pace of change will increase and, and the nature of tasks in the workplace will change. Therefore, uh, the structure of qualifications and the nature of programs are going to change and you get back into this discussion about what's the balance between generic skills or core skills, key competencies, call them what you like, and technical skills, how narrow are, are qualifications. One of the criticisms of competency-based training is that they, you, you, or outcomes-based education and training is that these qualifications are too narrow uh, and that we're not supporting teachers and trainers to be able to run the educational processes that develop the sort of core skills. So I think there's, there, there's lots of sort of discussions in there about how to, how to balance that kind of transition. There are very few examples of educational institutions <laughs> and educational programs that really base their whole delivery and assessment model around generic skills. Even if you look at the way key competencies in the case of Europe, for example, have been put out there as, a, as an important set of outcomes for uh, vocational education and training, there's evidence that whilst changes have been made at the curriculum level, so that, you know all the documentation has changed, if you like, in terms of actually assessment, and how the outcomes of that assessment is reported and whether or not that's actually captured within qualifications and certification systems. If you take out sort of IT or digital related skills from the set of key competencies, very little has been done to actually uh, uh, deliver uh, and assess or, or use assessment and certification as a way of ensuring that delivery of generic skills uh, adequately takes place. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done to Deal and some of the examples of the generic skills maybe for our audience. Yeah, sure, you know, problem solving, teamwork, communication, you know, analy collecting, analysing, organising information, these sorts of things, uh, which, which, which in the theory goes, you know, are applicable across a range of occupations and industries, not confined to a particular job or task. Um, so the importance of those things haven't gone away and you could argue that they're becoming more important. I mean, the idea of key competencies has been around since the late 80s uh, and, and we're still kind of struggling uh, or systems are struggling with how you actually engage with them. And let's not forget the issue of industrial relations thrown in there because basically it means there's a greater workload for teachers and trainers to run their classrooms in a way and deliver and assess that actually develops these things. It's actually more difficult than if you're focusing on sort of just technical skills development. But Maybe that's for an opener. Yeah, I would like to pass the next question to uh, Lindsay Herbert. Lindsay, your um, position, you're in ABM, and your position is called inventor and digital transformation leader. So you're working in the company that is seen as one of the global leaders in the field of artificial intelligence and you are one of the leaders leading the digital transformation there. So um, I assume you know something about the question, how can we 
compete or work together with artificial intelligence? And uh, the question that many, I think, of people in the room and in this panel are sitting with is, what is the human uniqueness in relationship to these technologies that promise to take all of these different aspects of what we normally were doing before? And where do you think would be the long-term, if we can call it, sustainable competitive advantage, like comparing the humans and evolving technologies? Mm, I think that's a great question. So, uh, well, first, first off, I want to start out by saying that uh, I'm actually here wearing a different hat today. I'm here as, uh, as an author of the book, Digital Transformation, and it relates directly to the question because, you know, yeah, my day job is I am an inventor. Uh, I'm an innovation leader. I work with major companies worldwide to further their innovation agendas. But the reason that I wrote my book uh, was actually pre-IBM, started it well before then, was because I was starting to see a repeated occurrence of companies using people to grow technology instead of using technology to grow people. And a lot of mistakes being made, a lot of money being wasted on expensive digital programs in companies and higher ed institutions all across the board. And what I wanted to do was set out and find what are the actual best practices of how people are meant to use technology for the benefit of people, you know? And one of my favorite quotes is uh, from the book Super Intelligence, you know, speaking of artificial intelligence. And it talks about the fact that Neanderthals, if they could have pulled the plug on humans, if they could have seen that threat coming, they would have done. Well, right now, are we potentially building something that is going to be our own end, be our own demise in the form of a, a higher level of intelligence than us? Well, I don't personally believe that because I think that people, whilst we might struggle with change, we're a bit, we're, you know, as a species, we're afraid of change, we're resistant to change, we're also very naturally curious. And I think as educators, as, as all of you in the room, we're all recognizing the value of nurturing curiosity and allowing curiosity to flourish well beyond childhood age, to build that into education programs and training programs. And instead of having the focus of education being around what grade are you gonna get, what qualification are you gonna get, instead looking at what problem are you gonna solve? And you know, I think back to the education I received. Back when I went to school, I couldn't have had training in blockchain. I couldn't have had training in AI, well, maybe machine learning. Uh, instead, I did my training in journalism. And I'm really grateful for it because it taught me how to communicate, research, work with others, find the story. But most importantly, when I get a sense of, of a problem I want to solve, I ruthlessly pursue a solution to it. And now I work for one of the biggest tech companies in the world and I get to call myself an IBM inventor. And I think that's the spirit that we need to be bringing to events like this, to the training programs we run, to education programs. It's how do you take that curiosity? How do you enable young people to go out and continue to network and meet and find the problems that matter to them, that light a fire in them that they want to go out and solve? And then they can use whatever tool they want to to try and solve it. That might be AI, might be a, a hammer and a wrench, might be a combination of the two. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Um, we can discuss a lot and uh, find out a lot of new technologies for the new age and we can discuss a lot about how to make new educational programs. But we all understand that there is uh, one role in this educational process and one person who really is the core. And uh, there is one person in this panel who knows most about that. Uh, Marion Plant, as a chief executive from Midland Academics Trust UK. What can you say about the teacher training? It's the thing, it's a core. If we don't understand what is the role of the next century teacher, we can't understand how to promote the technologies. So thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, yeah, so I lead a number of schools and colleges in the UK, and um, I lead a workforce, um, particularly of teaching staff, who are looking at this future with all its uncertainties. And it's, you know, working with those teachers 
That is my biggest challenge. How do I support and prepare them for their role in the future? Um, my personal view, I see an end to the predominance of lecturing. I don't think, you know, the giving of knowledge through lectures has got much more of a, a, a longevity. I think now knowledge is so accessible digitally and in the schools I lead, although we don't allow mobile phones in lessons, um, but the young people are taking their knowledge from phones all the time. So I think a lot of my teachers feel this is undermining their authority and I do see a, you know, a twin track here. I think the authority of teachers is changing. The authority is no longer as knowledge givers, but it's just what Lindsay, Lindsay was describing. Actually, you could argue the authority of teachers is growing because it's, it's the authority to stimulate curiosity, the authority to get these young people trying to problem solve. And of course, all of that comes in the context of having to provide the right environment for applied learning. So, all of us who lead educational institutions are looking for ways to create the right environment for applied learning, working with our industry partners, which has its challenges. Industry have their own primary objectives, and it's not always education and training, and we keep demanding of them involvement in education and training. But also, you know, providing skills experiences. And I've worked with World Skills UK. I'm the deputy chair of World Skills UK for many, many years. And I think the competitions that I hope you have all been able to see here in this wonderful, wonderful event are very much part of the type of skills experiences that develop the skills Paul was talking about, those core skills, soft skills, whatever the current language is. But it's for us as educators to find ways of exposing young people and adults to skills experiences that develop the skills. So I'm very curious to talk with you shortly about ideas. One of the things I've done recently is set up a big collaboration because I think that's another really important word in education, it's collaboration. So in the UK, we have different parts, as you all do, to the education system. And I've just set up an institute with four universities, one college and one industry partner, to train adults and young people using a lot of uh, virtual reality and AI in the future skills for the automotive industry, automated vehicles, electrified vehicles. And the fact that the universities and their research capacity are influencing the curriculum that is then delivered through active immersion with technology, not just passive technology, is feeling to me like a very good model to capture the changing needs in education and training. Thank you. And actually, the question that we, we already begin to explore here, but I, I would like us maybe to still a little bit explore the potential future we are going to, is how, how does the education and training system adapt? Uh, but maybe before that, I wanted to maybe encourage the panel, first of all, to think a little bit about what future we expect. I know there is an old saying, I think it originates from Danish, saying it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. But uh, still, we, we can try. And, um, if we think about these trends, these, these trends that, uh, of automation and, and uh, all the drivers that say we need to adapt to, to, to the more flexible uh, and more frequently disrupted job markets, and uh, we also say there are specific human qualities that can bring us there, such as complex social interactions or, as you say, collaboration. Uh, going back to this question of human uniqueness, um, one of the views suggests that we are moving towards uh, industries and sectors that will be increasingly personalized and uh, in which each of us will find their own unique uh, value offering for, for, the, for the global economy. For everyone in, in, in this room, everyone in the world participates in some kind of social web that is also online and connected to tools such as artificial intelligence. It will give us opportunities to cultivate our uniqueness and find our calling in the world. But it doesn't seem that currently the system is focusing on that. It seems that it's more focused on standardizing rather than 
cultivating our uniqueness. Uh, I would invite some of you, I think all of you might have opinions on this. How do we solve this uh, challenge between like moving towards being more unique in the world and being recognized by others by matching the standards? Is there a tension and how it can be resolved? I, I'd say straight off the bat that I, knowing how a lot of the algorithms work for personalization engines on you know, major media platforms, um, that yeah, they're absolutely not making anything personal. They're putting us into boxes. They're trying to very quickly decide what's gonna make us watch longer and more and, you know, more videos and, okay, you've watched this video, now here's another video that's the same but a little bit more extreme and a little bit more focused and then you get these phenomenon of people drilling down into topic areas that they just never would have been organically interested in, but it's almost like they've been forced into this, into this narrow vision of the world by an algorithm. Um, so the solution to that, because I, I, I fully believe we do need personalization because otherwise we're just being bombarded by information. Um, but the solution to this is we need more people involved in the making of those algorithms, in the training of those AIs, of that data. We need more people of diverse backgrounds, of diverse experience sets, helping to make the decisions on how those technologies work. And we need people, especially young people, to not feel intimidated to have a seat at those tables and to participate in those programs. You know, I didn't work with AI until I needed to use AI to achieve an end, and then I'd worked with AI. I didn't get a computer science degree. I didn't wait till someone gave me permission to do it. I started actually by taking an online course that was offered for free by Stanford University. Then when I got confused about some of the material, I used YouTube. <laughs> so, you know, this is how we need to be telling younger people in particular that this is the world of technology. It's not some ivory tower and no, no one has all the right answers. The only way we're going to get to those right answers is by having more people in the room, more people having a say, and definitely, definitely not leaving it up just to the computer scientists. Sorry to any computer scientists in the room. <laughs> so I think, just to add to that, so I think uh, what you just mentioned also speaks to two broader trends that we're seeing in the labor market. So one is that we are seeing a lot of new, very skilled technology jobs emerging, like those of big data architects and uh, you know, software engineers, Android developers, so on and so forth. The second is that we are seeing that people with higher incomes tend to demand a lot of in-person type of services. So sommelier is not a new job, for example, but it's actually recently become a new job title because as we grow richer, we tend to you know, want more such personalized type of services. And, and this is sort of the labor multiplier which has driven a lot of the trends that we're seeing in the labor market over the past 30 years or so. So on the one hand, we've seen that jobs which are done in relatively structured environments, in manufacturing, in warehouses, they have been automated and are increasingly getting automated away because its technology functions better in structured environments in general. And on the other hand, we see that most new industries that drive job creation, like creative industries, technology, uh, even finance, these are very clustered industries, right? And what happens when you, know, you create a new tech job in a city like Hassan is that that person goes out, spends his or her money on local services. Goes to the hairdresser, goes grocery shopping, takes a taxi and so on. That creates five new jobs in the local service economy. So we're seeing that economic activity is becoming increasingly clustered. That also means that you know, a lot of the jobs that we see are based on social interactions, are based on in-person uh, type of communication. And so what, we, what I think that the future labor market will look like is very much, on the one hand, people with very highly technical skills, but on the other hand, also people that are able to provide a very sort of personalized experience. Uh, uh, I really loved what Lindsay said uh, about the personal trajectories and uh, personal profiling of the competencies and skills. 
And uh, as Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. I also have a dream and we put it uh, in our federal project that by the year of 2024, uh, 24, every person in Russia would have a possibility, both technologically and methodologically, uh, to construct his own career, to develop his own uh, skills profile. So uh, it's a really important instrument. At the same time, I understand uh, if we want to build such a system, it should be standardized. If we put standards, that means we put someone in frames and that some difficulties appeared after that. In this respect, uh, I would give back the word to Paul. Um, there are some innovations in TVET. Probably they also cover the issues of personalized career managing or profiling of the skills. If we don't have some such instruments, we stop in developing. Probably you can mention some examples that would be really important for me and for the audience, Paul, about the examples in TVET, in innovations about the instruments for career developing or something that would help to profiling the skills. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the thing that came to mind is, as, as you were, I guess, joining the dots with the, the, the previous comments is, is you know, I think the, the role that um, uh, the recognition of, of prior learning, uh, validation uh, of skills becomes quite important um, because I, I think it, you know, you, if you're talking about pathways to learning, if you're talking about pathways to employment, then skills recognition and validation plays a very important part in that. But if you then think about our existing qualification structures and, and curriculum, then I think um, uh, national qualification frameworks uh, need to be a little bit more flexible in how they respond to uh, the recognition of non-formal and informal learning. Because if you, if you accept that, uh, you know, learning takes place in the workplace, learning takes place in the community, etc., cetera, um, uh, the valuing of that learning or the, the recognition of that learning uh, becomes important for uh, constructing a sense of how, you know, of what I've done in the past actually going to uh, connect with what I want to do uh, in the future. Um, so, you know, I think there's this tension always between standardisation, particularly with the role that, you know, industry and the private sector are now expected to play in vocational education and training systems. There's a lot of push to get employers and workers' organisations to come into TVET and skills systems and really take responsibility for setting the, the broad kind of parameters, if you like, of what should be contained in a qualification or, you know, what the competency standards look like. And, you know, that's, that, that's a good idea, but there are lots of issues around that in terms of balancing the needs of large and small employers, you know, rural, urban, uh, export, you know, value chain sort of configuration, etc. So, and the fact that often they're not educationalists, you know, there are some issues around, uh, around that um, uh, that I, I think need uh, to be addressed by making sure that educationalists remain around the table when you have discussions around, uh, around what a curriculum or what a qualification um, should look like. But, you know, the, as I said before, the extent to which these qualifications and programs become a lot broader to try and pick up these, you know, general sorts of skill sets that people are required versus cover off, you know, core content for a particular occupation or an industry area. I mean, I think there's always that kind of tension and, and you know, I, I, I certainly don't have a, you know, a, 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 a crystal ball in terms of how that might go. But, you know, I think we've got to recognise also that qualifications still have a lot of value. Um, and they still act as signalling uh, devices in the labour market and screening devices for employers. So I don't think qualifications are going to go away uh, anytime soon. The, the question is, you know, um, what, what value do they have? How, how, how can they be reconfigured to capture non-institutional learning 
and, and how can that be used to, to structure better pathways for people uh, into the future. Um, you know, the whole question of just-in-time learning, uh, you know, and this is where the computer stuff comes in, uh, the ability to learn small chunks, being able to capture that, link that to employment outcomes, uh, you know, still a work in progress. Just, just to add one point to that, which I think may be important. So on the one hand, I think these qualifications are really important signaling devices, as you mentioned. On the other hand, there's the problem of job switching, which I think we're going to come later, because if we need to switch careers many times um, in life, these can also provide hurdles to job switching. And if we look at the United States, for example, we see that there are many occupational licenses across states. They vary a bit across geographies. Uh, that makes it harder for people to move across state lines. It makes it harder for people to move um, across countries. And to a certain extent, also makes it harder for people to move into new and emerging jobs if they require uh, standardized qualifications. I think. I'm not against that, but I think it's important to keep sort of this trade-off in mind. I'll, I'll go before I'm asked a question. I get really frustrated when I hear these conversations because in my practitioner life, I feel really constrained on behalf of my young people and my teachers by qualifications and national curriculum. Um, and I think I don't have the answer. Um, every day I'm frustrated because I see the innovative and entrepreneurial sort of ambitions of some of my young people crushed by the fact they've got to get English and maths at certain levels. And I'm not saying English and maths, literacy and numeracy is not important. But we knock the stuffing out of people. And I think what we have to do is shift the balance. Educators need to work much more closely with policymakers across the globe. I think we need a lot more global co collaboration. I want to talk through the next six days with people, you know, people here about how is this working elsewhere and how can we get it better in the UK. I think um, we need more creativity across the board. I think a lot of our qualification structures don't focus enough on creative subjects. So the national curriculum for young people in the UK aged uh, 5 to 16, design technology, for instance, is no longer part of the national curriculum. And, you know, I think that's a real error, um, frankly. I'm, I feel safe because I don't see any officials from no. um, our policymakers sitting in the audience. But it's... Um, but it's being recorded. It's being recorded. That's absolutely <laughs> fine. They know my views. Um, and it's what the young people tell me. And I think back to what Paul was just saying, all of us have got to make learning much more adaptable. We've got to enable young people and adults to learn when, how, and where suits them best, because that is how they will flourish. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that so much. And just, I just, wanna, I just had the funniest thought thinking about qualifications, because I've, I've, I've hired young people, um, and I've looked at their qualifications, and someone's got a degree in English. Okay, someone's got a degree in mathematics, fine. It doesn't tell me anything about that person except for the fact that they have this, the, the ability to stick with something for you know, the duration of the degree. And then I thought, has anyone in this room ever looked at someone else's Netflix home screen or like their YouTube home screen? Someone else's. And then you immediately get so much insight into the person because with Netflix, it'll recommend things based on what you've watched before. And the fact that you can look at someone else's Netflix home screen and go, really? That's interesting. Oh, I didn't know you were interested. Okay, and have a whole conversation. And yet you look at their CV and they just look like carbon copies of one another. That feels fundamentally wrong. How do we get the Netflix home screen of the education credential system? <laughs> Precisely, I was actually going to also a little bit challenge this question of, but I think it's, it's really a pain, pain spot because on one hand we have to preserve some systems that allow us to keep going. On the other hand, we feel that these systems are increasingly relevant. And that by the simple fact that we remain attached to these systems, we limit our economies, uh, young people and adults alike of many opportunities in life that allow them to go, like you said, uh, into, for instance, switching the jobs towards new careers, 
That's just one of uh, the possibilities, but also in terms of how this can prevent collaboration, because a lot of collaboration actually ha happens on a cross-cultural, uh, sorry, cross-sectoral uh, basis. It, it requires the match of different competences and different types of skill sets. Uh, education, for, for one, is not the space where it naturally happens, unless you purposefully go for it. So, um, speaking about existing silos, things that keep, so to say, the existing system in place, well, it's a good system, it works, but it evidently becomes um, a, a kind of uh, impediment in the process of the evolving economies. We here have the, the slogan, skills for evolving economies. We are indeed in the economies that are rapidly evolving due to multiple reasons, and uh, we don't see education serving the need of these evolving economies. Uh, so the question uh, to, to you, uh, all of you, would be, how can we actually start breaking the silos? And uh, um, I think we didn't, we didn't mention this, but that was like um, the title of the session. We are already in the situation of lifelong learning because we are in the situation where jobs and markets get disrupted get sometimes uh, removed by the, the economic process, by the social process, new jobs emerge, so we really cannot guarantee uh, a lifetime career anymore, and we need to create uh, abilities for people to adapt, and we need to create structures that support them in this adaptation. So the question is, how do we create more flexible structures, structures that are less siloed and more interconnected and allow more flexible ways of learning, more flexible ways of collaboration co uh, and learning from each other across, across the spectrum. What's your opinion? I'll jump in on that one. I mean, I think, uh, you know, so for, I'm, I'm from the ILO, right, and so this year's our 100th anniversary and we've had this big Future of Work Commission report and a centenary declaration and one of the things that our 189 member states gave priority to was lifelong learning as the pathway to engage with uh, the future of work. And so, you know, that's not a new idea, uh, but I think it does provide, uh, um, you know, an organising principle for policy makers and institutions and other actors in the education and training system to rethink what they're doing uh, through a lens that sort of asks the question, to what extent are we uh, uh, supporting lifelong learning? And so then, to pick up your point about, yes, well, we're working in a system, but how, you, you know, maybe parts of it are good, maybe parts of it aren't, how do you bridge to the future or whatever? You know, so what are some key areas I, that, that I think, you know, we've got to work on? And one of them is this whole link between vocational education and training and higher education, and the way that those systems exist as silos and these sort of artificial distinctions about learning in one uh, sector versus learning in another sector. Um, I, I think if you look at some countries that are trying to reconceptualize post-compulsory education and training as one sector with different institutions that provide different sorts of offerings rather than saying, oh no, you know, you're going to go into this sector and that effectively is, is as far as you're going to go and if you want to pursue higher learning, we make it very difficult for you to, uh, to, to pursue a program pathway uh, further on. Uh, so, you know, I, th I think that's one issue that really needs to be uh, looked into. I think the other thing we've got to acknowledge is that in many countries around the world, there is insufficient funding allocated to vocational education and skills development. And that's why uh, people don't want to do it. That's also uh, why you have employers saying the quality is poor the relevance is poor, there's a skill shortage. Uh, you know, there's a feedback loop in there. If you don't invest in institutions, if you don't invest in staff, uh, if you don't provide resources uh, to deliver high quality training, then you're not going to overcome uh, some of those sorts of barriers. So I, I think, you know, in a lot of cases, this isn't rocket science. Uh, there's a lot of organisations that advocate, you know, a range of policy measures about how to strengthen TVET about how to strengthen skills development, how to improve quality, et cetera, et cetera. 
but at the end of the day, it comes down to making policy choices, allocating resources, and actually making it a sort of a priority. And that's partly why we're here supporting World Skills, because we see that as being part of the agenda about raising conversations around TVET and skills and, and trying to add some momentum to those debates. So I think I don't want to repeat what I said, but absolutely to endorse in practice the point about working with high, TVET organisations, working with universities and higher education. There's two problems I'm trying to solve in the localities that I serve, which happens to be in the middle of England, and uh, no one's mentioned the B word, but with the B word, come, that's the one, the Brexit word, I don't like to say it, but with that coming towards us, this is, you know, really making these problems acute. So one problem I have to solve is the logistics sector, the moving of goods in and out of the UK. I don't have to solve on my own, but I have to work with others to solve. And, and the automation in that sector, how can we rapidly get the skills in for the future of that sector? And the only way in practice that I'm able to have some small impact on that is by working with a university who has re research collateral in logistics. And so we have industry partners, people who actually work in the logistics industry, a very high-powered university, and a TVET organization working together to solve the problem. And that is really powerful. And I mentioned earlier, we're doing the same in the automotive industry. Um, and I think the other point I wanted to reinforce that Paul just made, the valuing of the skills that TVET delivers, the valuing compared to the academic skills that too many people better understand, Events like this can really showcase and help to raise the value of vocational skills in the eyes of those who ultimately hold the power and make the policies. And so, all support to this type of event. And maybe, um, kind of just to continue, and, and uh, you, uh, Lindsay, you, you said that if we only had some kind of Netflix-like system which could support um, our understanding of each other profiles of preferences and interests and competences and so on. And I wonder, actually, and you're being immersed in this world of technologies, to what extent there are already prototypes of such potential system which can actually become the bridges between elements of the educational system. And to what extent actually education technologies can play a role in, in this landscape of future education and training approaches as, as bridge builders and as also providers? Um, well, you're, you're going to hate my answer because it's not very technical. Uh, because to me, the best ways of making connections is still the good old-fashioned human way. Um, so actually, probably one of the best platforms, one that I use very regularly, is LinkedIn. Because if I want to reach out to someone who has a skill set that I don't possess, being able to just send them a friendly message, introduce myself, they can see a picture of my face, I can see a picture of theirs. We set up a web chat, you know. Um, but I, I've, and even building on this theme of, of how do we break out of the silos, to me the best teachers are also connectors. They're people who if they don't know the answer, they feel okay about saying, I don't know the answer. I'll connect you to someone who can help you. And I think there's a really important point on this, that we're living in an age of such accelerated change and such increasing complexity in a technological space, but also social, political, everything around us is changing so much and so fast. No one can be an expert in anything anymore. There is always going to be a gray area where you're going to benefit from leveraging the skills of another. And I think sometimes actually, you know, and, and in my position where I've got younger people reporting to me or, or, or I'm mentoring someone, um, it helps me to find the answer to them because now I've got the excuse to reach out to that person that I don't know. So I think celebrating that need for human connection to be able to answer the challenges, the problems that we're facing. That's the really critical part. And to stop trying to think of it from a policy perspective of, you know, is this mandated within my program, within my curriculum, and instead just think, if I care about helping this person and solving, helping them solve the problem they're trying to solve, how do I go about doing that? You know, and just approaching it that way. 
there's probably not a single place where the silos are more extreme than inside universities. And I think uh, that one of the things that I treasure about the Oxford Martin School, the place that I work, is that we are actually trying to encourage collaboration across disciplines in the university, right? So I'm an economist by background. My research team is with engineers for doing mobile robotics, machine learning, and so on and so forth. And at the normal university, if you're an economist, you would see sort of trends in technology trickle down to your department three decades later, right? Uh, and now we're actually able to see what's happening at the very forefront of technology. And, and I think this is something that needs to be done, not just within universities, but also across different training institutions. So there's no need that there should be this sort of very clear distinction between vocational institutions and universities, uh, for um, example. And I also think that much of the silos actually also to some extent has to do with culture. So in Sweden, for example, you work with what you studied, right? If you study, if you want to become a lawyer, you have to study law. In the UK, you can study classics and then you do conversion course to become a lawyer. And I think we need more of those approaches where you can actually switch careers or switch sort of uh, paths uh, more easily. Um, and uh, lastly, and I maybe think also breach, like this major and minor system in higher education in some countries. Like when you can bridge two totally disconnected disciplines, yeah. but really find something beautiful at the intersection. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I think uh, also if, if, if training institutions want to remain relevant, we need to apply much more modular approaches to education, right? So it's just absurd that you should study for three years uh, or whatever that time may be. And you know what you've learned by the end of those three years it's very individual. Uh, so why not make the time of learning variable and you know the learning target fixed, right? So you can study it in three weeks, three months, or three years, depending on the speed that's required. And that would also make it a lot easier for you to develop those skills in parallel to your current job. If I could make a point, just picking up on this silos thing, I think one thing we really haven't talked about is access either, you know, access to learning. Where can you undertake learning? And I think this issue of coordination, uh, not at an institutional level, but at a policy level and at a, a government level, if you like, uh, is, is necessary to basically try and develop more of a national learning ecosystem and you know that's what kind of lifelong learning is partly about where you bridge the silos between social protection systems labor market programs training because you're unemployed with systems of um, uh, you know uh, initial vocational education and training ministries of education uh, with ministries of labor in terms of continuing education and training um, uh, ministries of uh, regional development. So often, you know, skills and TVET systems are characterized by significant levels of fragmentation. There's lots of different actors, lots of different buckets of money, uh, different policies. And if you're an individual trying to not only piece together the outputs of all of that, but actually navigate those systems, I, I, I think, you know, the way they're structured in a, little, a lot of places actually works against that. And, and makes it difficult for individuals to navigate. So, you know, it's got to work at the institutional level, but it's got to work at the policy and, uh, and, and uh, you know, national institution level as well. I'll just throw something out here too. Um, this problem with silos is not unique to the education sector at all. This is any large organization has silos and it goes back again to human nature. We, we like predictability. When things get big and chaotic, we try to instill order on it so that we know what we're gonna do on a Monday morning and we know we're gonna finish it by Friday at five o'clock so we can go home to our families. Um, and so the silo issue, you know, when I, when I wrote my book, um, you know, it's called digital transformation, but the definition I say of digital transformation is just becoming more adaptive to change itself. You're leveraging technology to become adaptive to change. You're leveraging new ways of working brought about by the digital age, but it's really just about being adaptive to change. And the very first stage that I talk about at great length in my book as a result of interviewing people from 
all over the world, all different companies, including universities, but private sector, everything. The first stage I call bridge because by nature of organizations getting big and complex, those silos form and suddenly you're not paying attention to the outside world anymore. You're not even paying attention to the colleagues you've got on a different floor than you because you're so preoccupied with what ends at the end of your own desk. So the more we can do as professionals, regardless of what organization we work for, to get ourselves out of that siloed mindset and be thinking, again, in terms of goals and problems that matter to a larger group of people, that's what's gonna help us break out of those silos because now we have a reason to engage. I've got a problem to solve, I wanna to talk to you about it. And, and also just as a little extra side note, Every single person that I interviewed for my book who wasn't already a contact of mine, I cold reached out to them on LinkedIn. <laughs> well, well, I think we show that we can answer the questions. Um, uh, if we have a look on the analog education or digital education anywhere, the interaction is the center of the process. Um, let's show our audience that we can follow this track as well. I would propose the following. Marion, do you agree with me? Uh, can we ask the questions for ourselves? What are the stumbling blocks for, uh, for us for the education of the future? And probably ask the audience. What do you think? You're asking me whether I agree we should ask the audience? Absolutely, because I think we can learn from each other and that's the benefit of a forum such as this. So, I saw the microphones coming out a minute ago. Let's have some views from people who are in the systems around the world. So, we invite turning the table and you giving, not, not only asking questions, but giving your opinions about what are these drivers of transformation, what is actually happening, what are the key things that invite the change and what is going to happen? What, what do you anticipate? Good evening, everyone. On honor Gardenica is my name from Nigeria. Mine is going to be a sort of comment or contribution to, to will I say, support all that have been said earlier. To, have, uh, to increase uh, the productivity level of uh, graduate, okay, well, I should start like this, that to have a certificate from, a university certificate from the university or any higher institution is good enough. That is the starting point. But to increase the productivity, uh, productivity level of individuals, for example, a, a degree older in English can increase our productivity by becoming a professional in education, journalism, in law, and you know what, by, by so doing, the level of productivi uh, productivity becomes finer, it's become more. So, so instead of saying uh, uh, paper qualifications are not that reliable anymore, my, pro uh, my point is professionalization will make things work better in the work industry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the possibility to share some examples and experiences from Finland. We have had a very flexible system in vocational education already, but still we needed to restructure it once more one year ago. And uh, we decreased a lot the amount of qualifications to make them more flexible so that the students can choose from uh, models and they can be part of uh, basic education in vocational education or they can be from further qualifications so that a student can be on different levels depending on each kind of um, skills and competencies. So it, it's really revolutionary, not ready yet, not the teachers are all loving that so much but they still think it's a possibility and we are working towards a better future for the learners. So please, you are welcome to visit the Finnish examples in vocational schools. <laughs> Hello, 
Uh, I'm Seamus Lahart. I'm, I'm from Ireland and uh, president of a teachers' union. And uh, we try to change the curriculum to, you know, to follow this pathway. But uh, um, what I'm interested in is uh, we have traditions in education. We have, you know, we still teach Latin and the classics in Ireland, believe it or not. We, 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 we like to think of ourselves as the land of saints and scholars. And uh, there was a move recently to remove history as a, as a compulsory subject, you know, for our lower examination. And there was an outcry. So when we go to change the curriculum to, you know, to follow the route that you were talking about, uh, there's only a certain time in the week so sometimes you have to, you know, there's a suggestion, well, we won't do that, and then we'll do this now. And then there's an outcry. So what is, I'd be interested to know how you manage that and what's your view on that, because as soon as you go to modernize, there are new things to be taught. But as I said, the, the, the week is only, you know, is a certain con confined period. So if we're going to teach mathematics, and we, we teach physics, and we teach uh, IT skills, all the, 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 the skills that the people downstairs or in, in, the, in the competitions, all of those have those. I suggest that they, today they mightn't have much interest in Shakespearean English uh, uh, or you know, what was going on at that period of time. So how do you manage that? Because as soon as you go to modernize, then you have to leave something behind. Or how can you manage that is my question. Thank you. I, I can... Uh provide some, some thoughts on that because uh, this whole idea of resistance to change in, in the face of external pressure um, is, again, it's a, it's a problem. It's not just limited to education. It's, it's every company, you know. Why should, we, why should we change what we're doing? We've always been doing it this way. We've been, you know, we've built a legacy of 100 years, you know, 200 years, etc. cetera. Um, and it, it what you were saying just now about taking history out of the curriculum gave me a flashback to when I was learning journalism. And there was a decision that had to be made by the school that I went to about whether to switch the students from using a traditional wet lab for developing photographs to a digital lab. And ultimately, the decision was made by the people who were going to be hiring the journalists, the newspapers. The newspapers were switching to digital labs, and so if you were only trained in wet lab techniques using processing chemicals, um, then you were not going to get a job, and that was going to hurt the school and its employability ratings. Was there huge outcry? Were tears shed when the dark room was finally closed down and converted into a room full of Macintoshes? Absolutely. In fact, I was in the class that got the half and half, so I learned both wet and digital techniques. Um, I think it all comes back, though, to the question you have to ask yourselves as educators, why do we exist? Do we exist to uphold our own traditions, or do we exist because we have an obligation to prepare people for the world that they're actually going to be living in? And if that world doesn't need them to learn Latin anymore, but it really needs them to learn IT skills, then we're failing on our own mission by not introducing that change. And, and if it comes back to the real principles of why you exist, that can often help win those arguments when someone is, is just really clinging to the past for those wrong, wrong reasons. I've also just written a book about resistance to change, and particularly technological change over history. And what you see is that up until the period of the Industrial Revolution, actually the craft skills uh, blocked almost every new technology that they perceived threatened their skills. Um, and the main sort of change uh, in that was actually global uh, competition or competition between, between cities. So competition has always been sort of the key force in driving change because organizations realize that in order to survive, you actually need to change. Uh, the other point to be made is that uh, over the 20th century, for the first time, resistance to change become much uh, less of an issue. Um, and one key aspect of that is that uh, training institutions emerged that help people uh, adjust to changes by allowing them to acquire new skills and switch jobs more easily. Secondly, 
labor unions actually played a vital role in managing the transition, in negotiating with management to make sure that actually people were provided with the new skills uh, in the new job roles. They are making sure that people didn't drop down into lower jobs of lower pay. Uh, so institutions and competition, um, I think, are the key uh, aspects that can help facilitate change. I just have one comment, because you're living in the real world, and so my dream, you know, isn't the real world at the moment. But I think it's back to how we teach, not necessarily what we teach. It's the delivery of knowledge. So our curriculum is structured around we need X number of hours to deliver the knowledge in Latin. I don't do Latin, but, you know, in these subjects. And my dream would be that's, that the knowledge is learned more from application and that we shift the whole way we teach, so a lot less upfront as I said earlier, lecture or in schools, you know, teacher teaching and a lot more young people being enabled to learn for themselves using technology in an active way and learning from each other. And then I think we can get more flexible in the hours that we allocate to, to the different skills and knowledge. But that's, I recognize absolutely future, you know, it's not the here and the now and it's not the constraints that we're having to manage in the current system, I understand that. Uh, yeah, I feel like this is a very rich panel, and we are about to finish it in the next few minutes. And I feel we are only kind of begin to scratch the surface. Like, uh, when I was looking at the list of questions we wanted to explore, I felt like we could have a three-day conference only dedicated to questions explored in this panel. So um, I feel like this is the beginning of conversation. So what I wanted to leave us with, all of us, is more questions to explore. Sometimes questions are more potent, more powerful than answers. So uh, I wanted, like, as a final question to our panelists and to ourselves, I wanted to ask us to state a few questions that we all are sitting with at the end of this panel that will continue this conversation for us when we leave the room, or maybe still in the room. And one question for me, which I, I feel is, can be part of the story, we couldn't explore it now because it's like, again, maybe a big panel of its own. We mentioned a lot of the, we talked a lot about these generic skills, these human skills, complex interaction skills, creativity. And we also know that over time, these, these general skills, they evolve as we gain more of what is known as wisdom. So we talked about competences, we talked about knowledge, we didn't speak too much about wisdom. But there is definitely a role for wisdom. There is also a role for people who have wisdom, especially older, more senior people who gain this wisdom over time. So my question that I am continue to explore in the context of lifelong learning, in the context of training for tomorrow, how can we leverage the wisdom in our society how can we bring more of this wisdom to the learning processes? And how can we learn over the lifetime so we can gain more wisdom for ourselves and others? What's your question, Marianne? Oh, I've got so many questions. I'm just listening to you, and I think it's how we harness the wisdom of young people to be much more influential in the how and the when and the where. And I think, you know, we put young people too quickly into silos and too quickly into methodologies that we predetermine for them. So my question, which mirrors yours, but the other end of the spectrum, how do we um, allow our young people to be much more influential in their own learning? Paul, what's your question? <laughs> yeah, well, I, it's, it's a slightly different one. I mean, I, uh, because I, I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of... Uh, uh, talk about, uh, you know, digitalization, the pace of change. We're facing this, you know, new world order of, uh, you know, a gig economy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it, I'm still trying to grapple with to what extent people working in institutions at the coalface, if you like, you know, in a local labour market, dealing with employers from an education and training perspective, uh, you know, how much of uh, a demand for new products and services are there, you know, are people actually coming to you and saying what you're delivering isn't good enough and we want 
you know, X, Y, Z to be added into it because I think there's a lot of hype around this and I guess just trying to unpack the hype a little and understand, you know, what, what's actually happening in local uh, kind of uh, skill ecosystems is, uh, is, is the question that, that, that I ask. Somebody told me the other day that our parents had careers, we have jobs and our children will have gigs. Um, and I think one challenge going forward is how, what institutions are required to provide fulfillment and to provide security in a world where you will have to ch uh, change jobs probably many times throughout a career. Uh, because I think that to many of us that may be exciting, but to many also quite frightening. Um, so because I'm last, <clears throat> and we've got lots of great questions already, uh, and because I was never good at following the assignment given to me by the teacher, I'm going to do something slightly different, which is I want to set you guys a challenge for what you're going to do after the session is done. We've talked a lot about the doom and gloom and the threats and the things that are scary and, and big, um, but I want instead, we're all about to go and you know have some networking, have some drinks and stuff, I want you to think about one example in your career, in your life, of a beacon of shining hope that keeps getting you up out of bed in the morning when you feel like all these obstacles and all the bureaucracy and everything is weighing down on you. What's an example of a story where actually it's gone amazingly well, where some innovation took place, where someone wasn't stifled by the curriculum and was able to shine in their own unique way? You know, whatever that story is, I want you to think about it and I want you to tell it to someone else. And specifically, if it's a really good story, I want you to tell it to me, because I collect stories like that. But to end on a note of positivity, and we're all here, and we're all networking, and we're all going to share stories, share your story of success with one of your fellow colleagues in this room, and use that as the conversation starter going into the, the networking and the drinks, rather than thinking, oh, the future. <laughs> We're here, it's the present, let's celebrate it. <laughs> so that's my challenge to you. <laughs> Ooh, a lot of food for thinking. Well, um, as a person who is dealing with digital economy and digital transformation, uh, I fully understand, and hopefully you all, that the, all the digitalization, all the education technologies are only the instruments. So by themselves, it's not a goal to develop them, to make them work. Uh, the main role of the education is a change, is a development. And in this sense, concerning the food, we all know if we want to feed someone once, we can give a fish. If we want to feed them for the whole of your life, we should give them a rod. But the main problem today, some people do not want to fish. They have the rod, and we don't know what motivate them. And that is the most painful question for me. How to motivate students, learners, and teachers today? We have a lot of things that takes our attention. And my question is how to gain attention to the education again. With this, we thank the panel, we thank the audience, and let's explore this further. Thank you very much. <laughs>